Good morning, Faith Church. If you don't know me, I am Brian Eide. I'm one of the elders here at Faith Church. And so I have the, the joy of preaching from Ephesians 4 today. How exciting is that? Uh, we'll get to it in just a second. Uh, if you don't have a Bible this morning, I would love to, to just let you know that we'd love to give you one. Uh, there are Bibles at the back of the, the worship center here. And uh, if you want to slide over and get one either now or after the church uh, uh, service is over, that would be uh, our gift to you. But let's go ahead. If you're able and, and ready, would you stand here? Um, for the reading of God's word. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body, and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if you've had the privilege of being here with us uh, at all over the past few weeks, you know uh, that we've, we've been introducing just some wonderful truths out of Paul's letter to the Ephesians, truths that really uh, have a, a powerful impact to shape our identity, and uh, what a wonderful thing that is. Um, it, we, I, I just recap a, a couple of them quickly, right? Uh, truths like this, you're chosen uh, if you're in Christ, adopted, loved, you're free. The chains of your, your sin are, are gone, liberated from that slavery to sin. You're marked with a seal, making you God's, uh, you know, uh, God owns you, putting his seal of ownership on you. Uh, you've been given the very victory of Christ Jesus. Think about that. The victory of Christ. Uh, Christ promises those that are his to raise them up at the last day and seat them with him in the heavenly realms. Church, if you are a follower of Christ, if you're in Christ, this is your heritage. It, it is no wonder that David kind of prophetically could echo in the Psalms years before the arrival of the gospel. Why so downcast, O oh my soul? Right? He talks about forgetting not all the benefits. In other words, he's stirring up in song just a recollection of the truths that are meant to encourage him and bolster him and strengthen him in good times as well as bad times. That's awesome stuff. But my question here for us this morning, and, and it's really kind of strategic since the letter to the Ephesians is about to turn a corner. We've been, we've been positioning ourselves with foundational truths that are more of a theoretical level and about to make a, a turn into something that you might just broadly call a more practical level, all right? Uh, my question is this. Are these truths simply meant to encourage us? I mean, if that's all they're meant to do, that, that's a good thing. No getting around it. And they do. They're lofty. They're wondrous. Or are they meant to do something even more? You know, one of the, the biggest questions that I get in my, my Bible class, uh, I teach high school Bible, I, I get the question regularly. The most frequent one seems to be along the line of what is the purpose of life? That, that's changed over the years. It used to be things like, hey, can we trust the Bible or, or is you know, science or the Bible, uh, those used to be the nature of the questions. Now, people are just mainly focused on, hey, what is, what is the purpose I'm here for? And it's no wonder, as Dylan has already been kind of unfolding over the last few weeks, when we're so confused with our identity, it makes sense that our purpose is kind of up for grabs. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a, a clear argument this morning that I think that these truths, as encouraging as they are about who we are in Christ, are meant also to shape uh, what our calling and our purpose is. So uh, let's go ahead. We're going to just kind of turn the corner to say hmm, that, that purpose, if we look for a biblical purpose 
for life itself and for what humanity is all about. Hey, we can, we can revisit just a couple of quick things, right? Genesis 1, uh, you know, 2, and uh, make it clear that we're to be fruitful, to multiply, to have dominion over the earth. The Westminster Confession adds to the idea, using scriptural ideas, that we are to glorify God and enjoy him forever. These are good things. I think Paul's going to do some things here that will build consistently with these as well as we look through Ephesians 4, or at least the first part of it. The problem as we look at the idea of what is a biblical understanding of our purpose is that we're swimming in an ocean of different ideas that are louder so often than the scriptural ideas about what purpose and calling for life is. And so we're really, we're going to spend some time this morning allowing Ephesians to recalibrate and to redefine what our understanding maybe for life is. This morning, as we make our way through the first part of it, I'm going to identify four truths, four truths about living a, we'll call it again, redefined and recalibrated life that are in step with the biblical purposes that God has for us. So let's take a look at that here together. Uh, The first principle of the redefined and recalibrated life is that we are to live rather differently, a whole different approach. We are, we are to live for more than ourselves. There's nothing in this culture that is going to really give us that sense, right? But let's take a look at the scripture again. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit, the bond of peace. Now, it may be interesting to you as you stop and look uh, that Paul identifies himself as a prisoner for the Lord. And that is the case, literally, but we'll see it's figuratively the case too. Literally, he's writing to the Ephesians, to the church in Ephesus from prison. He is it's probably 60 to 68 to AD, uh, scholars think. He is writing uh, under a house arrest in Rome. Uh, what's his offense? Uh, he's been preaching the gospel. So literally, he is a prisoner for Christ, right? But in addition to that, we could also say very clearly he means this in, in a figurative way as well. Because even in the times where he's not imprisoned for preaching the gospel, he would still consider himself captive to the will of Christ. In other words, he's recognizing his life no longer belongs to him. He doesn't get the free reign to say, hey, I'm going to do whatever I want. He recognizes that something of these wondrous truths that he's been talking about from Ephesians 1 and 2 and 3 are laying a claim to his life. But this is a voluntary captivity we're talking about. And I think it's very clear that Paul would call us to follow his lead, that he would call us as followers of Christ to yield willingly to be captive by his will, all right? Now, another important thing that we want to emphasize here up front, and and both of these ideas may at first seem like, hey, let's get on to the other stuff, but who does he address? He addresses you. I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord or the Lord's calling, but let's not overlook the idea you is more accurately you all or if you prefer something a little more slang, all y'all, okay? Uh, We're saying, hey, church, you, plural, are called to walk in a manner. And I think that's a very important thing for us, not something to gloss over this morning. So often, we want to think of our Christian faith and our experience of it as a solo event. But the majority of the letters written in the New Testament make clear that this idea of you plural or we're in this together folks is part of what's really being called right and again that's just not it's countercultural in every way we we again we're solo creatures uh, at least by our instinct but but here we're being called to a life of community and really it's uh, 
it's pretty vivid. If you go back to chapter 2, I'll just briefly reference here from chapter 2. It says, in him, referring to Jesus, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. Literally, the analogy he uses in chapter 2 is your life is like a brick in God's larger building of the church. What are bricks good for? Not much all by themselves, right? It looks like a a hot mess if you've got a, a yard full of bricks just strewn about, right? You gather those bricks together, though, and you build them. You interlock them one with another, and you build something wondrous. All of a sudden, something individual and by itself, having no real, uh, you know, impressive quality, can be used for something magnificent. And in a very real sense, God intends for you and I join together in the community of believers to be interwoven in such a way uh, that makes some glorious statement about what he's done, all right? Well, the rest of this opening sentence kind of unfolds here with an assumption of the community that I'm talking about. Notice we're, we're highlighting ideas of humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, even maintaining unity. Folks, these exhortations, these challenges make no sense if we don't have a meaningful uh, interaction with each other on a routine basis. If you and I keep each other at arm's length, we're not going to need to exhibit too many of these qualities Hey, you know as well as I do, uh, people can pass through a week without really having any deep connection. And, you know, you can keep enough nicety that you really don't have to tax yourself very much as far as bearing with people or, or loving them, maintaining unity. This, again, only makes sense if we are actually in each other's lives. And that's the assumption here in chapter 4. Again, we've been through three chapters of Ephesians at the front end, outlying lofty things about our identity. But now we're getting grounded in something practical to realize, hey, you're going to take all of that identity and you're going to bring it to a regular and routine uh, involvement in one another's lives, right? And so, uh, again, Paul's going to assume this. So, some application for us right here in this first point, right? A little self-check, and, and I need this as much as, as I'm putting it out there for everybody. How, how are we doing? How are we doing in this idea of forming relationships? Let's just say, hey, especially if you've been here, if you've been here for any length of time, you've been here for a year, okay? I mean, I don't know where you draw the line, but let's just say you've been here a year or more, right? Have you made any new connections in this last year that would reach outside of our Sunday morning time? Have you, have you gone out to lunch with somebody, somebody you didn't know? Hey, here's a, a radical idea. Ever had somebody over to your house from the church, somebody you didn't know? It's like, I just want to get to know them. Forging a new relationship. I'm not even, by saying one in the last year, I'm not, I'm not even talking about some lofty goal, right? But folks, if we're going to be in each other's lives, I think just a, a natural challenge and an application is saying, hey, are we working to form a new relationship, a new connection? We can't, we can't be in each other's lives if we don't even know each other. And so I just want to encourage us that way. You know, similarly, let's suppose we've been here for more than a year. Uh, are, we, are we open to the idea of branching out a little bit, making a new connection, we tend to have our circles, all of us do, right? Uh, how about making a, an attempt uh, in the next you know, few months to, to say, I'm going to make a connection of somebody I don't, even, I don't even really regularly interact with uh, outside of my own group, could even be outside of my age group, right? Huh, older people, I want to challenge you. Don't shy back from uh, getting involved with a, with a younger person here in the church or younger family, but similarly, younger family. <laughs> don't, don't write off this idea of, of forging uh, a relationship with somebody well older than you, right? This is, we're called to do life together, and it's not just by cliques and, and age groups. We're, we're called to know each other. And so, uh, again, 
just talking very practical. Now, let's do a reality check. I, I do live on this planet. I do get where <laughs> some of our struggles come from. Uh, I, I hear some of your voices because I hear my own too. Hey, if we're going to get involved in the lives of others, oh, man, that could get messy. It's time-consuming. It's risky. People might let us down. They'll certainly at times frustrate us, right? Uh, we, we, we know that's the case. Yeah, relationships are complicated. Yeah, they are. I, I, don't have any, I don't have any anecdotal kind of solution for that. Paul, Paul is going to be assuming that we're going we're gonna to run into some difficulties. He's going to assume that we're going to disappoint each other. He's going to assume that we're going to find our t- ourselves in times where we're going to need to ask for people's forgiveness and where they're also going to need to give us forgiveness, where we're going to need to give them forgiveness. You see, again, these ideas make no sense if you say, I've got to exercise humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another in love, maintaining unity, if the expectation is, man, we've got it all together. We, we don't have any problems here. It looks good, right? No, Paul is assuming that we can be a hot mess. And because of that, he's assuming that the gospel and the mercy and the wonder of what Christ has promised us is greater than the difficulties of our hot mess. You you hear me, church? Uh, This takes a huge measure of faith. But did we not sing earlier this morning uh, that we believe God can move mountains and take care of our battles? Would we not have faith to think that God can help us in the midst of challenges, even with one another? We're called to live for more than ourselves. If we've been chosen, adopted, loved, set free from sin, and given the victory of Christ, can we trust him in this area? I want to challenge us uh, accordingly. Well, uh, again, for various reasons on any given Sunday, on any given Sunday, in any given church, you will find people who are disappointed, disappointed with one another, disappointed with leaders. Maybe it's a decision made. Uh, You could find people disappointed uh, just for not receiving gratitude or or just something, right? We we are offended for a a variety of reasons, and I'm not even suggesting without reason, right? But what's the calling to exhibit these qualities in, in such a way that trumps whatever else we might experience in disappointment. Now, here's what I'm not saying very clearly. There are times where, where problems uh, arise that certainly need to be dealt with. I'm not talking about turning a blind eye to everything. But what I am saying is we can come with humility and gentleness even as we work out solutions, right? That this is the call, right? To bear with one another and to work through uh, problems big or small. But... Back to it, it's amazing how oftentimes small problems can become huge when we're not willing uh, to, you know, uh, take a posture of humility and forgiveness, right? And so uh, I just want to encourage us this morning, as Paul does, let's deal with things biblically and let's continue to pursue, you know, this idea of being involved uh, in one another's lives, uh, even though it is, it is messy. All right. All right. Let's take a a look here. That was our first redefined and recalibrated idea that we are to be others focused. But we've got another uh, thing to look at. Not only are we called to a different approach to life, we're called to a different mission in life. And that different mission, I'm going to say, we're keepers of the faith. We are keepers of the faith. And notice that we've got in this passage here, uh, verse 4, there is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. We've got in just three verses, seven times, Paul emphasizes one all right? The word one is used to describe the teachings of Christianity. And you know what? That was radical in Paul's day, just as it is in our day. 
right? We've got, uh, you know, if you want a technical term, we've got religious pluralism that is active in our day. That, that's the idea that there really isn't any one right religion, that all are valid and, and you know, each, uh, you know, posit their own truth and all will get you to the same place uh, in the end, right? And the biggest, the biggest affront uh, to so many is the idea that you would say exclusively one particular religious idea or one religious leader or teaching would trump all the rest of them, all right? That was offensive in the Roman Empire. It's offensive in our day as well, right? And so we just kind of realize the exclusive monotheistic nature of Christianity, it's not negotiable. Uh, I just recap a, a couple of verses here for us real quick. I'm the Lord. And there is no other. Besides me, there is no other. That's Isaiah 45. John 14, many of you are familiar with. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. Or you could take Acts 14, 11 through 12. Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Really, you see these verses, and you say, what do I do with this? The truth is, many of us, uh, many of us have fears related to this whole idea of running kind of counter to our culture in such a way that maybe gets us labeled intolerant or bigoted, which are two you know, easy uh, terms to throw out to anybody that holds exclusive truth. And, you know, maybe you feel this uh, if you're an older person, but I tell you what, college students feel it vividly. Uh, they've got to they put ideas out there online and in posts where everybody reads, and it's like, well, if you go against the flow and suggest something more in keeping with the faith, uh, that is a a hard position to be in. And we just got to recognize we are called, we are called to be keepers of the faith. And the temptations that we face are obvious, right? Uh, we can, just as so many culturally, even in the church, are inclined to do, we can sort of distance ourselves from Scripture. We devalue it by basically saying, well, I don't know, I'm not going to talk about that one, or I'm not even going to turn to the Scripture. We can kind of think of it as outdated or irrelevant, not in step with the times. That happens in churches, right? But there's something that's equally tempting here for many, and that would be to somehow rewrite or rebrand Scripture to say something that it clearly doesn't. Oh, come on, uh, Jesus, I, I love your original work. We need to freshen this thing up. We've got to get it with the times, right? But, folks, we're, we're not given that opportunity. We are to be keepers of the faith, non-negotiable in this. And with that, right, we need to be students of the word who are able to accurately and lovingly communicate the truth. You know, as I, I think <laughs> you've seen the movie uh, National Treasure, uh, the Knights Templar were to, you know, protect that treasure, right? But the, the, the difference between the Knights Templar and what we're talking about here is they were to keep that treasure kind of hidden, secret. You and I are called to be keepers of the truth that are willing to go public with that idea. And I'm not saying we're trying to stir up trouble everywhere we're going, but we're neither shrinking back from this idea of upholding sound teaching from the scriptures. Well, as we think about that, uh, one thing that we kind of come to recognize again, every word of God proves true. He's a shield to those who take refuge in him. That's from Proverbs 30. 2 Timothy says, all scripture is breathed out by God. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That would go for the ladies, too. All right. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him. And I love this. It says, let none of the words or his words fall to the ground. And so and just, I want to challenge you lovingly this morning. Uh, how are you doing with this? Some of you have a deep and abiding passion for the word of God. 
and it is dwelling richly in your life. I want to continue to, to just kind of cheer you on in that. Continue uh, to, to do that. You are strengthening our church body as you are strengthening your awareness and understanding and time in God's word. That, 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 that overflows to benefit this entire congregation. If you're not in, involved in pursuing the word or if you'd say, hey, I've been letting some of his words fall to the ground. Listen, my encouragement to you this morning, my encouragement to you this morning is to start again. Make some space in your schedule to pursue the word. It's part of our calling as a body together, right? Maybe, maybe some less screen time. Maybe limit your time with those that have no interest in the things of the faith. I'm not saying cut it off altogether. I'm saying maybe you need to make some, some just kind of parameters that would, would give you some room, right? You can't, folks, you can't serve two masters. You'll either love the one or hate the other, right? It, it, that, that's Jesus saying that. And, and the bottom line is maybe some of the appetite for the word is being lost because of other things you're pursuing. I would invite you to prayerfully just ask God, hey, what adjustments would you have me to make that my hunger for your word might be growing? This is, this is vital, right? We are keepers uh, of the faith. That is what we are called to. Well, a third element of this redefined and recalibrated life recognizes that we have a different mission than the world around us, all right? We have a different mission, uh, but it also, uh, or that was the second one, but we also have a different community, this third one, and that different community is that we seek to serve one another. And this too is rather radical. Verse 7 says, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And so, uh, you know, just very quickly, uh, what we have here is a picture of Christ descending from heaven, right? Uh, fulfilling his earthly mission. That mission was to lay his life down, to conquer sin and death. And at the resurrection and at the ascension, which is hinted at here, literally Christ's victory is just on display. Uh, he is pictured here by Paul as kind of plundering the enemy. Who is that enemy? Well, in one sense, that, that final enemy is death itself. He plundered it, right? But he also plundered the, the realms of darkness, right? And, and so in, in doing this, this, this is an already victory and a victory that we have yet to experience in full. But it uses imagery that any king might be thought to have done when, when a victory is won over, you know, a, a, an opposing army. You plunder that army and you, you, you distribute your gifts, uh, the, the, the bounty, the, the loot from, from, from the opposing army uh, to your own people, right? And, and literally, that kind of imagery of Christ's victory leading to gifts being distributed amongst us is what we're talking about. Some of these gifts include, you know, uh, what many would suggest are, are, are kind of past offices of, of helping in the church, things like apostles and prophets. Um, but we still, still see here mentioned some that are very much active today, the idea of, of, of uh, uh, advance the, the screen here, uh, the idea of teachers and, and, uh, and those uh, evangelists and shepherds, uh, I'm referring to a pastor, all of these are, 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 are to help build up the church. Now, we know, just borrowing from other scriptures, that, that where Paul writes the same thing, these gifts aren't limited to these kind of positions. Uh, Paul makes clear elsewhere that every one of us have been given spiritual gifts that are to be used in this similar way for the building up of the church. What I want you to recognize here isn't so much this idea that we all have gifts, although I do want you to know that, but verse 12 tells us something important. These are to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Now, 
That begs the question, who are the saints? It would be, in some people's minds, to kind of uh, think of the saints as some subset uh, of the church, some super-Christians, as it were, people that have been canonized as, you know, special Christians of the ages. But that's not what Paul has in view here. A saint, in Paul's estimation here throughout the New Testament, we see it used this way, is anybody who's been born again. Folks, if you're a follower of Christ, if you've received uh, the blessings of his wondrous promises, you are a saint, and you are called to be equipped for the work of ministry. That means all of us have a role. We all play a role in, in the you know, continued uh, life of the church and the ministry of the church. We can play that role in formal ways. And folks, we need, let's just be honest, we need lots of people to step up here and, and, and serve here in our church's day-to-day -day ministries. Oh, we need you. You're a vital part of this, uh, whether, whether young or old. Well, we need, we need people to be volunteering for various things. That, that's a true statement, all right? It's not only related to these formal opportunities, though. Some of it happens on an informal level. You come on a Sunday morning, and you're just mindful of a word of encouragement given to another, praying, taking time to pray for others, whether here Sunday morning together or on your own throughout the week, praying for the health of the church. These are ways to serve in ministry together. And I love one of my favorites, some of, the, some of the practical ways people do this informal ministry. I know it was just a few months back, my wife had back surgery, and she was laid out for a long time. I can't tell you uh, just how blessed we were by the outpouring practically of people, you know, uh, serving uh, through providing meals. Uh, one person even came over and very humbling for us, but clean, cleaned our bathroom. I mean, it was like, wow, uh, that was so, so, so kind. Uh, and so I'm just saying there are lots of ways, both formally uh, in the day-to-day -day ministry as well as informally, where we have the opportunity to serve each other. And these are things that are to characterize our very ministry and our very community. And so uh, that third one, we seek to serve each other. All right, the final one, the fourth and final uh, idea of this redefined and recalibrated life, it's radical as well, okay? We are called to a different kind of dialogue, and that dialogue is that we are to speak and receive God's truth, the ideas to one another, okay? I say it's radical because, let's be honest, we live in a time period where we don't like anybody to tell us anything unless we're ready to hear it. Uh, it wasn't always as prominently that way as it is today. People just don't want the counsel of others. And uh, the, the scripture is clear, uh, you know, in a variety of ways that we, we are inclined here to, to think of uh, some things like uh, the, the idea that we, um, well, Proverbs 14:12. Uh, says that there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death, right? Uh, we, we are all prone. Jeremiah uh, says that the heart is desperately deceitful or wicked above all else. We are, we're prone to make mistakes, to error. And Paul is making it clear that we are going to need one another to help to recalibrate our path and our direction. We will not stay the course, you and I, without the input of other people. And I'm going to tell you what, we're postured well if we think about the first three elements of this calling, right? We started out saying it's going to take a lot of humility and bearing with each other. But if we've got somebody humble that is willing to serve us as they're being keepers of the truth, when we get off track, hey, that's the best case scenario for somebody speaking into our life and, and being a means of help when we go off track. Now, similarly, that means you and I are, are called to be that person at times, too. We may have to have a challenging conversation at times, right, to speak the truth. But notice a, a couple of things that we'll say here. First of all, uh, this is for maintaining the unity of the faith, and it is to mature. Look at this uh, illustration, to mature manhood. The idea of these tough kind of moments of dialogue 
is that we might grow up into maturity. And as a parent, many of you parents in this room, you understand this. There are times where you have to have a tough conversation with your child, but you do it not because, oh, that sounds like a fun time this evening. We're going to spend an hour talking about something really difficult. No, you do it uh, even though it's not timely, it's never convenient, and it's rarely fun, right? Uh, you do it because you want the best for your kid. You want them to grow and to thrive and to reach full maturity. You see the path they're on, and you say, hey, I need to step in lovingly to speak truth here. Now, sometimes those go better than others. I understand, but there's an obligation there. And the same is true in church life together. We are a family, and sometimes we need to have family conversations with each other, and their conversations, just like in my family, that sometimes I'd rather not have. But a healthy family is willing to have a real dialogue that speaks the truth in love, and that's exactly uh, what is talked about here with this idea, speaking the truth in love, where to grow up into every way, into him who is the head. Before we wrap up with this idea, I just want to revisit on the previous part of this, right? This idea, if we do this, we won't be considered children or infants in the faith. We won't be carried about by every wind of doctrine and deceitful schemes. And I just got to say, if we refuse to allow others in to speak the truth and love in our lives, listen, we're, we're subjecting ourselves to being on a spiritual roller coaster, Sometimes I, I encounter people that want to know why they don't ever seem to grow in faith. And there can be a lot of reasons, I understand. But sometimes it's just because we don't humble ourselves in, in a posture that's willing to receive from anybody else. And I, I tell you what, you, you and I will not grow in our faith if we are going to go solo and, and just kind of stiff arm input from anybody else. I'm not saying we got to make it our business to be in everybody else's business and to speak truth where truth isn't invited at all. I'm not saying that. But listen, if Paul is putting it out here that there is an expectation that we have tough conversations and speak the truth in love, then a church can only be as strong and healthy as it's willing to do this very thing. And in so many churches, this is not happening at all. Folks, a mark of a healthy church is a willingness to take this to heart. But I think, as we've already mentioned, this is going to really rest on the first three of these principles being played out, that there's already the fruit of humility and a willingness to serve one another, a willingness to hold on to truth and not to go with the, the flow of the culture. So these are radical. These are radical. As we wrap it up, right? Uh, we just kind of recognize we, we've looked at we've looked at four principles and they really they really are countercultural four principles of a redefined and recalibrated life and in doing that listen uh, we've talked about many many things today mm, God doesn't usually work in my life and I'm thankful for it and I don't think He works in your life by overwhelming you and flooding you with every possible thing that you need to grow in in one week. My encouragement to you today is if there's one thing that kind of stood out here, one thing that you felt the Spirit stirring you in, prompting you in, saying, gosh, I could take that to heart, then grab onto that one thing and make that your prayer throughout this week. But I want to encourage us once again that our purpose and our calling is not to just live out our own life. God has called us to something bigger and loftier. He's set us up with, with you know, statements of identity that are so grand, they only make sense that he's given those to us to equip us for a bigger purpose than what we would be prone to live for left to ourselves. Let's press in to the purpose that he's called us to. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we just thank you. We thank you. For the wonderful truths in Ephesians. We thank you, Lord, that from before eternity passed, you knew us and you called us to be yours. We thank you that you have set your seal uh, upon those who are in faith. Lord, we, we thank you that there is therefore no condemnation. 
uh, for those who are in Christ Jesus. You have set us free from slavery to sin. But, Lord, I pray increasingly that you would open our eyes, that these wondrous truths would set us on a trajectory to grow and to embrace your calling and purposes for our lives, even to be willing to swap our dreams for yours. God, that's only possible. That we're, we're only going to do that uh, through the power of your Holy Spirit. We invite you to take greater kind of presence in our lives. Lord, give us that heart like Paul to be captivated by your will and your direction for us. Help us to bend our knee, Lord. It doesn't come easily or naturally, but help us increasingly learn to put on that humble heart. Help us, Lord, to be keepers of the faith. Help us to serve each other and help us to both speak and receive the truth and love. We just give you praise and thanks and we pray that you would continue to bless our church. In Jesus' name, amen.